Animal Magnetism by Elizabeth Inchbald, read by Timothy Hurley. Act 3. Enter Lisette and Lafleur. But where is this farce to end? My master, now he is introduced, will take advantage of some circumstance to obtain, either by force or stratagem, the doctor's consent to his wishes. And as he finds, he is beloved by the young lady, which before he was in doubt of. Pshaw! He might easily have guessed her sentiments. A young woman, weary of confinement, as she was, is easily in love with the first young man who solicits her affections. And may I hope you love me? I, sir, I am weary of confinement, like my mistress. A thousand thanks, my dear Lisette. But while Geoffrey keeps the keys of every door, no creature can either go out or enter without his leave. Yes, a thought strikes me this moment. A couple of days ago, one of our neighbor's dogs bit him, and our doctor, merely to show his skill in the cure, persuaded him the dog was mad. Suppose we make the doctor himself believe he really was so, and that poor... Enter the doctor. He has had another fit, but I have just now left him in a sound sleep, which came upon him as suddenly as any of his waking paroxysms. If that is the case, he must be left alone. We will not disturb him. When I return, be sure to confirm whatever I shall say. Lisette exits. What? Have you persuaded her to leave you? Yes, for a little while. Why, too much of love is something tedious. I come once more to talk with you, doctor, about this surprising art, which, though you have taken great pains to explain, I am still far from comprehending so much as I think I ought. I will, before long, give you such proof. Enter Lisette, followed by Geoffrey. Oh, save me, save me, or I am a dead woman. What's the matter? This is no joke, and I won't take it as such. Have a care of him. Don't speak to him. Speak low. He'll be at us. Will be at us? Jeffrey is mad. What do you say? I found him on his bed, gnawing the bedclothes, and when he saw me, he would have gnawed me too. Don't look at him. Don't look at him. Why, I don't think this possible. The dog that bit him was not... Indeed, sir. He was mad as ever. Indeed. The poor creature looks as if some horrible infection had seized him. Why, I can't say, but that I think he does. And I'll give you the true proof immediately. Lisette goes to the toilette for a glass of water and throws it on Geoffrey. What's that for? How dare you use me thus? There. You see what a dislike he has to water? That is a symptom which confirms our suspicions. An evident sign of the hydrophobia. Yes, of the hydrophobia. Lisette comes with another glass of water to throw at Geoffrey. He starts. See? See how he looks only at the sight of water? If you dare throw any more upon me... Geoffrey holds up his hand. Lisette, let him alone. It is dangerous to push the poor creature to extremities. Doctor, suppose we magnetize him. No. Magnetism, in cases like this, can have no effect. What remedy, then? I know of but one, and that is to smother him. The only thing in the world. And we ought to lose no time if it must be done. What? Smother me? Geoffrey falls on his knees to the doctor. Oh, sir, have pity on me. Don't be frightened. It will be over in ten minutes. But I had rather not. Ungrateful wretch, do you consider the consequence of living? For shame, Geoffrey. Don't ask such a thing. But since he won't consent with a good grace, we must seize him all three together. Oh, mercy. What will become of me? Run out of the house and never come back if you would save your life. Geoffrey runs off. He shan't escape. Stop him there. Lafleur exits after Geoffrey. Why, he has run into the streets. What a deal of mischief he may cause. And as I'm alive, he has run away with all the keys in his pocket. But luckily the doors are open. But why does not the doctor come back? Depend upon it, he will not leave him till he has him secured in some safe place where he can do no mischief. Enter Constance. Dear sir, come to the assistance of your patient. He has followed me to my chamber and frightened me out of my senses. I thought he was going to die. Indeed, sir, he is so very ill. I'm sure he can't live long. Enter the Marquis, creeping slowly to the couch, as if unable to walk. Oh, doctor, relieve me from this pressure, or I die. I wish my brother physician was returned. Come, sir, lean your head this way. Where's your complaint? Here, here it lies. 
The Marquis lays his hand on his stomach. I fear this is the last hour of my life. No, no, I hope not. The doctor magnetizes the Marquis with his wand, but in a very awkward manner, sometimes with one end and sometimes with the other, uncertain which is the right, and much alarmed. The malady changes its place. Oh, oh, my head. Remove it from my head. Make it descend. The doctor more frightened. Now it fixes on my heart. It sets it on fire. It tears it to pieces. The Marquis rises himself and is totally silent. I wish the doctor would return. My tortures redouble. Vultures gnaw me. Can't you remove them? The doctor attempts again to magnetize. No, no, my strength fails me. My eyes lose their sight. I die. The Marquis groans, sinks on the couch, and remains motionless. Ah, oh, he's dead. He's dead. He's dead. What will become of us all? He is dead. I am quite shocked at it. But my dear children, don't make such a noise. The neighbors will hear you, and they will say I have killed him with some of my experiments. It was the fatal wand you put upon his heart. Yes, I suppose I directed the fluid the wrong way. But perhaps he is only fainted. Who knows, but we may recover him. I will go find some of my new invented drops, which may perhaps restore him. The doctor feels in his pockets. And that poor, unhappy Jeffrey has taken away the key of my cabinet, where all my drugs are. Break open the locks, then. There's no time to lose. And Dr. Mystery not to return. Everything conspires to ruin me. I was loath to receive this patient into my house. My art foreboded some ill consequences. Dear me, adieu. The doctor exits in great uneasiness. The Marquis rises. If my scheme succeeds, the consequence will be such as you little dream of. Where is Lafleur? Gone to secure Geoffrey somewhere out of the house. If he does not return soon, all my long concerted plan is overturned. Here he is. Enter Lafleur. I have lodged him safe for these two days. The Marquis taking off his robe. Give me your clothes and take this immediately and be dead. Dead? What do you mean? Ask no questions, but lie down on that couch and counterfeit being dead. Your master has been doing it this half hour. Lafleur dressing himself. It is very strange, but since you command it... Dare not stir or breathe. All depends on your acting well. The Marquis powders Lafleur's face. You must have your face powdered, that he may not know you. Now I'm in character. Where are my people? At the tavern in the next street, both disguised like doctors. That's right. I fly to them directly. The Marquis starts to go. Your nightcap, your nightcap. And give me your wig. The Marquis puts on Lafleur's wig. I hear the doctor coming. Farewell. Play your part to a miracle. The Marquis exits. And heaven prosper your designs. Lafleur sitting on the couch. But what does all this mean? I don't understand. Lisette throws Lafleur down on the couch. Hush. Dead people never speak. Enter the doctor. Well, how is he? What does he say? Why, like all other persons in his state, he does not complain. Hold this bottle to his nose and sprinkle this upon his face. Alas, he's gone and nothing can be of use. How a few moments has changed him. He's as white as ashes. Lay your hand upon his heart, Lisette, and feel if it beats at all. For my part, I am so disconcerted with the accident, I am fit for nothing. Lisette laying her hand on Lafleur's heart. All is still, sir. Is there no motion? None in the least. Like marble, no feeling in it. Dr. Mystery not returning. I conceive this was a plot upon me. And this poor creature was in the plot, you think, and died on purpose to bring it about? No, but the other found he could not cure him, and so left the disgrace of his death to me, and my enemies will take the advantage of it, considering how many of my patients have died lately. What are we to do with the body? I have yet one hope left. It is my last resource, and I won't hesitate but about it instantly. What resource? He is certainly dead, is he not? Certainly. There can be no doubt of that. And do what we will. Nothing worse can happen to him. No, certainly not in the world. Well then, I will try an experiment upon him, which I once read, and I have often had a vast mind to try it upon Geoffrey. But as he was alive, it might have proved fatal. 
What is it? No matter. You shall see it performed, and I can't say I have much doubt of its success. Begin to take off some of his garments, while I go get all the apparatuses ready. The doctor exits. Lafleur rises. But I am not such a fool to stay till you come back. My master may say what he will, but I will go away. Nonsense, man. Have not you undertaken to be dead? Come, finish the part with a good grace. Pray do, Lafleur. But what experiments is he going to try upon me? I always hated doctors, and would never let one of them come near me. But this is not a doctor. The college have refused to admit him, so don't be afraid. Oh, if that is the case... Hush, play your part. Lisette throws Lafleur down as before. Enter the doctor with a bag of instruments. Lisette, help me with these instruments, and then run and watch that skillet of oil on the fire. And when it boils, bring it hither. But suppose anybody should come in while you are trying the experiment. Right. I'll lock the door. My fright makes me forget everything. The doctor exits, Lafleur raising himself. Let me see the instruments. Pshaw! What signifies seeing them? Ain't you to feel them? What? What's a dumb man doubts whether he will or no? I hear a noise. It is the Marquis returned, and all his schemes perhaps will be fulfilled. Enter the Marquis, Picard, and Francois disguised as doctors. The doctor following. I have powerful reasons for entering this house. I come hither accompanied by these physicians sent with me by the college to demand a patient who was this morning brought hither by a notorious professor of quackery. Mm. The young gentleman is of family and nearly allied to me. I am undone. Where is he, sir? I must see him and speak with him. At present he can't speak with you. He's in a better world. Alas! Behold him there! Or am I deceived? No, it is him whom I see, and he is dead. Gentlemen, I call you to witness he is dead, and that yonder stands the assassin. Picard and Francois examine the body. Picard puts on his spectacles. Francois feels for Lafleur's pulse. Yes, he is dead. But he is not dead, according to our rules. Oh, my dear friend, and are you gone? But your death shall be revenged. Villain, tremble, for thy life shall answer for his. Gentlemen, gentlemen, please to take notes of what you see and hear in this house. The doctors begin writing notes. Lisette kneeling. Dear sir, have pity on my poor master. He's killed the gentleman, to be sure, but it was without malice. But, you know, gentlemen, this is not the first patient that has been killed during an operation. I, by the authority of the college. Dear sir, my only hope is in your mercy. Then despair, for know I am the Marquis de Lancey, and call to your remembrance with what insolence you rejected all my overtures to espouse your ward. Here is the advantageous contract I repeatedly sent to him, and which he had the arrogance to return to me, without even deigning to look at it. Only deliver me from this trouble, and I will sign it without reading it at all. But will the lady also sign it? No, for how could I wed another, while he is the object of my love? But consider, my dear Constance, that I am old, ugly, jealous, and infirm. Indeed I am. I am. I protest. Constance. But my love for you is so implanted in my heart. If that is the case, come, sir, follow us. Stay. Give me the contract and let me sign it. I will once more have recourse to the wand. What imports your signing if your ward will not? She will sign. Never. Give me the contract and hold that. On taking the contract, the doctor gives the wand to the Marquis. The doctor signs the contract. What is this? Keep it. Never let it go from you. Yes, I feel a desire to sign. Give me the contract. I, I was sure of it. Constance signs the contract. And there is the contract. The doctor gives the contract back to the Marquis. Lafleur raising himself. Ah, I breathe again. I am a little better. Why, he is not dead. No, I'm mending a pace. Gentlemen, tear in pieces the process. Oh, sir, what misery have you brought upon me? And what misery would your damned instruments and your boiling oil have brought me? How did you hear, in that fit, what I did? Very easily, sir. 
return him the wand, and the ladies, I dare say, will fall in love with him again. My eyes are open. I recollect them both. But this was the sick man. But I was the dead one. I am cheated, defrauded. What? Ho, neighbors, here are thieves, murderers. Nay, doctor, reflect upon the arts you made use of to keep my Constance yours, even in spite of her inclination. Then do not condemn the artifice I employed to obtain her with her own consent. A reward like this urged me to encounter every hazard and every danger, for believe me, doctor, there is no magnetism like the powerful magnetism of love. Finis. So concludes Animal Magnetism by Elizabeth Inchbald, read by Timothy Hurley.